All right, well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's a great day to be in the house of the Lord. Amen? Amen. 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 Awesome. So, a couple of quick announcements. All right, for the little ones, class is already back there. Miss Brenda's already <laughs> back there for the little ones. Um, teenagers, um, Lori's group is going to go back right after announcements, okay? So when the first song starts, teenagers go on back for fundamentals, okay? That will go as soon as the first song starts, okay? A um, couple of announcements, okay? Let's go through your first things. For everyone that's been bringing stuff in for the food pantry, there's more stuff in there again this week, and as Jerry said, it's been coming in uh, really well. So thank you all for that very much. Um, continue to do that. We have that advertised on here also. Still have some opportunities to serve as readers. Just sign up in the back. The, the papers are still in there. All this stuff is in the bulletin too and in the email that goes out every week. So uh, please consider doing that. For youth group, I know that October, because of a lot of things and weather last Thursday, was really kind of a wash out. So we're really going to be looking forward to having a great November for youth group. Um, we're going to have our regular meetings on the two Sundays. We're going to be in the Haven of Rest on 11 9. I'll be sending out an email for all of this. But since we ended up getting rained out for our corn maze outing um, in November, we'll have our yearly turkey bowling event. And the turkey bowling is going to be awesome this year. So I'll put out the dates when that happens. And for those of you, like, I see if some new faces that I haven't been here before, we do actually bowl with a turkey. So it's going to be actual turkey bowler. It's pretty awesome. So that'll be coming up also. Also on November 20th is our fellowship dinner in the month of November. It'll be Thanksgiving style or Thanksgiving themed. So more information will be coming on that from Terry. Um, other announcements. Yeah, we'll do here too. Um, prayer requests and praises. A um, couple of updates from last week. And I'm like, can I have Andy? It's okay. Okay, yeah. Uh, be a prayer for Andy. Andy, on the last game of the year, of her senior year, she got a ball kick to the temple and got a concussion. So she's going to the doctor tomorrow. So be in prayer. I don't want to get to such bad, you know, misfortune for that to happen. But pray for that. So she's doing okay, but really hoping that whatever the doctors find tomorrow is nothing big. And, um, you know, she gets over that. Those concussions are nasty injuries, you know. So really be in prayer for Andy for that. Um, got an update this morning from Sarah on Kenny. No change on Kenny. So he's just, you know, he's kind of in that waiting in the last moments of his life. So continue to pray for Kenny and uh, for his family. Uh, continue praying for Norm Webb. He's doing okay, but we did get those updates. Becky uh, Potts added this morning her friend, uh, Kathy, who was recently diagnosed with dementia. So that's also a hard disease to deal with, so really keep Kathy in your prayers. Any other uh, prayer requests that we want to add? Uh, Lisa, how's your grandma? She's still issued, okay. um, and they found a spot on her blood. Okay. And they don't know if they can biopsy it at all. She can handle that for biopsy. Okay. All right. Keep on praying for her. Sally. Okay. If you didn't hear that back there, Sally's friend Abby, who had a stroke, is walking now with crutches, which is huge. So continue to pray for Abby, 23-year-old girl who ended up having a stroke, 21, 21-year-old girl ended up having a stroke. So continue to pray for her. Any other prayer requests, praises, anything been going on this week, anything to pray for? to work on the border, border patrol. And so be praying for him. So anything else to add to our prayer or praises? <coughs> All right, we'll definitely be praying for Mr. Pond. Lucy wants to give praise because she, she found a salamander walking through our flower bed yesterday. <laughs> I don't think I 
I've seen one since I was a kid in school. I was like, what? She was holding it. I said, Lucy, it's just a worm. And she goes, but it's got arms and legs. I'm like, it does. So much cuter. Right? Um, so yeah. All right, well, if there's nothing else, we're actually going to have a little bit of a special thing here that we don't normally do. As all of you know, John and Joy are back. They uh, were on an Emmaus weekend the last two weeks, and they are going to share with all of you a little bit of their experience and kind of what happened on the Emmaus weekend. So uh, with that, John and Joy, why don't you just come on up and share a little bit. to go to Emmaus for weeks now, right? Thank you for that. But what the heck even is Emmaus? Um, physically, it is three days and three nights for you to focus on your relationship with God with no distractions. No kids, no running kids everywhere, no games, no spouse, no Netflix, no job, no phone, no watch. No distractions. Just three days for you to make God your first priority, three whole days. And you get a once in a lifetime experience for this, and there's a lot of sacrifice that goes into it. Personal sacrifice of time, self, and money. And it is your opportunity really to hear what God is trying to tell you. And it will be as powerful as you allow it to be, and it will be as weak as you make it. And so I want to make sure that you all get the opportunity to go, but that your hearts are ready and open to receive what God's trying to tell you. And so it'll be different. It'll be different for what you need. Maybe you need healing. Maybe you need to let go of some anger or some bitterness. Maybe you have some addiction. But you have to let go of those things to let God give you something so that you can be equipped to go out into a dark world and really help somebody and make a difference in someone's life and change it and share God's grace with them. And for me, that's what this weekend was. I was showered with so much love and compassion and kindness that I didn't deserve, and it really showed me what God's grace is. And it was given to me with human hands. And now I am full, I am so full of God's love and peace and joy and grace that my cup is overflowing to the point where I can go out in a dark world and use those things and show other people God's grace. So, thank you. I feel like I should crawl. I am not that good of a speaker. So, um, thank you, Diane. Um, I'll just speak more from the heart, wrote some stuff down, but um, I gotta tell you guys, it is extremely hard right now, and it was really, really hard my first Sunday back, which was last week, to sit here in this, I'm gonna pretend like I'm not on fire, because I am on fire for my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ right now, and it is so awesome, you guys. I am going to be in strong prayer, um, for our church and for our community, for each of you to hopefully attend a program like this. It is phenomenal. It is, I'll, I will look at some notes here just to reference them. It is set on a beautiful grounds in Navarre, Ohio. Um, the program is so well thought out. It is unbelievable the amount of detail that goes into um, what you receive as a, as a person that's going through this. It is, it is unbelievable, you guys. I, I can't really find the words for it. Um, essentially, there's uh, several educational talks that they give all through the weekend. And so you learn a lot about um, grace and, and different things like that. Um, but it really breaks it down and defines it, and then you have some fun with it, talking around um, about what that means to you. Um, it is absolutely going to, in one way or another, um, highly affect um, your spiritual um, strength with, with the Lord. And um, and I cannot tell you how many times I have uh, reflected on that weekend over the past two weeks in my daily life and now becoming a better minister to my students in my building and friends and staff that I work with 
and hopefully you as well. So if you have any questions about what Emmaus really is in more detail, or it's something you might consider in the future, we're happy to help. I know that, um, of course, uh, Pastor Vince and Lori have gone through it. Um, Charlotte's gone through it. Um, they also offer a teenage version, um, which is called Chrysalis, and uh, Lucy and, no, Lucy's not gone yet. Sally has gone and served. Um, once you go through the program, you also have an opportunity to give back to the program. And um, I'm telling you, it, it's amazing. You'll walk away full, full, full. I will also end this by, end it by saying, um, I snuck in for the 8.30 service this morning. And so uh, Pastor Vince's message today, if you listen to it and really take heed what what is being delivered, will really speak volumes to Emmaus. So, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, John and Joy. And yeah, if you have any questions, uh, John and Joy, me and Lori, Sally, definitely for Christmas, uh, for Christmas. Marisa, you've been through it. Yeah, she's been through. And you've served on Christmas also, right? Did you serve on Christmas weekend? No, yeah, yeah. Um, ask away. Brenda, you've been through it. A ask away. You, any questions that you have, um, really going to be really going to be a focus. So with that, brothers and sisters, teenagers can go back to Foundations class. Miss Lori is ready for all of you. And uh, for the rest of us, why don't you stand with me as we open up our worship service uh, this, this morning. So this song actually only has six verses in the hymnal, but there's seven on here, we think. Um, so we're going to repeat the first verse when we get to the end.
bow our heads and pray, brothers and sisters. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity, Lord, once again to wake up this morning and to proclaim how great you are Amen. and how wonderful you are. And thank you for every blessing that you've given us. As we gather here this morning, Lord, brothers and sisters in the faith, a family, Lord, because of your blood brought close to you through your sacrifice. We ask you humbly, Lord, to forgive us of our sins and draw us close to you and help us to become more like you every day. Lord, in those areas in our life where we struggle, help us. In those areas in our life where we continue to trip, pick us up so that each day we look a little more like you we sound a little more like you, and we act a little more like you. We love you, Lord. Grant us this prayer. So many prayer requests we lift up to you today, Lord. We pray for our, our sister, for our daughter, Andy, Lord. Please be with her and let her feel better. That this concussion, Lord, can just go away easily. Give her peace about it. Give Jason and Aubrey peace about it, Lord. Help her to heal quickly. Let this just be a little bump in the road. Lord, we lift up to you, Kenny. We continue to lift up to you, the, um, Dan's mom and dad. We continue to lift up to you, Ryan's dad, that you're watching over them and helping them to feel better every day. Lord, we lift up to you, Kathy, that you help her, Lord, with, with uh, this dementia, which is a horrible disease. Lord, we lift up to you, our friend Dan, who was deployed here recently to go work at the border. Keep him and all of our, our troops and first responders that are in harm's way safe. Let your angels circle around them. Give their families comfort, knowing that you're with them, protecting them. In this moment, Lord, we pray for the first responders we have right here in our church. Watch over them. Lord, we pray for Matthias, who was deployed here not too long ago, to the Middle East. Continue to watch over him. And give their families comfort and peace of mind. And Lord, we have so many praises to lift up to you. Lord, we're, we're thankful for Abby that she is not walking again. Continue to help her in her rehab, that she continues to feel better. We're thankful for Jack, Rachel's dad, that he continues to feel better from his surgery every day. Lord, we pray for Lacey's grandma, that you watch over her. Lord, we pray for all the students that we have in the back, from the youngest to the oldest of them, that you keep them close to you. Help them in their way. And watch over them. We lift up to you, Lord, all of the prayer requests and praises that are in our hearts and minds that we've not spoken. Because there's not one place, Lord, that we can hide from you, for you know us. We give you our burdens to carry, Lord, when we're weak. Lord, we lift up to you, our church, that we continue to fulfill our mission of spreading the gospel, of being a light in the darkness, of, be, of being a place where people not only get to know Jesus, but can, but can understand what it means to be like Jesus. That we can truly be ambassadors of you on this earth as we are called to do. We lift up to you the gifts that we receive today, Lord. That they're given with cheerful and generous hearts, knowing that all things come from you and all things return to you. Jesus, we love you. Be with us today and always. We ask for this in your precious name. Amen. 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 Please uh, stand. The next song is on the
with all the prayer requests and prayer um, rejoices that we've spoken about today. Please uh, have the message uh, flow through us today and we can show God's love to others in uh, the world we live in today. And please just um, let the words resonate with all of us today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I have to share something with you, with you all before we get started. As I think about these songs that we sang today and singing them all and stuff. <clears throat> it wasn't until I went through, and maybe it's 18 years ago, that I would sing in church. Because I grew up going to church like, you know, old, old school Italians, right? The way it worked was like this. Family would go to church. Then the mom and the little kids would go sit in church and actually pay attention. And the dads would hang out in the back of church. Or usually right outside the door and smoke until church was over. They come in for communion and then they leave. That. That's the way church went. And I remember when I finally turned like 17, and my dad was like, you don't have to go sit with mom anymore. I was like, sweet, I'll go stay in the back with dad, right? Because that's the way it went. A lot of times we would actually leave and drive around for like an hour and then come back and pick up my mom, right? <laughs> but the only people that sang in church were like the moms uh, and the women, right? The little kids, like, man didn't sing in church, right? It was weird, right? So I got to a when I was 30, and at worship service, I know you sing. They sing all the time. I'm like, singing is weird. Weird men sing. I'm not singing, right? But then I go there, and I see these big dudes, right? Dudes that look like they could take care of me in a hot minute. Not only are they singing, these dudes are choked up for that. Amen. I remember yep. thinking to myself, I'm like, surely if that dude can sing, <laughs> I can sing. And ever since then, it's just been a thing. And sometimes it's just that initial getting over the hump, right? Sometimes that initial getting over the hump. Anyway, all right. So today we're going to be still in our series in discipleship, spiritual transformation. Um, changing, changing our hearts, changing who we are. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 5. This is the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount covers Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Today we're going to be reading verses 1 through 12, the very beginning of Matthew chapter 5. And what we're going to talk about, the topic of today's, is going to be about values. And we're going to be comparing and contrasting the values of this world as opposed to the values of the kingdom. And the values of this world are starkly in opposition to the values of the kingdom of God. Um, let's do a little bit of background first. First off, and I, I have to touch on this. Today, if you're a Protestant, the big day of celebration, right? Today's Reformation Sunday, right? This is like a big deal. Like Catholics get all sorts of fun days to celebrate. We get Reformation Sunday. What is Reformation Sunday? So Reformation Sunday, we celebrate the start of what is historically known as the Protestant Reformation. On October 31st, 1521, young Catholic priest Martin Luther wrote and 90, who had written 95 theses. These were all points to call the church back to basing itself on the word of God. The church had gotten off track, called the church back to the word of God. So he wrote these theses. He was so upset that he got up on October 31st, 1521 with a hammer and some nails and this thesis, and he nailed them to the doors of Wittenberg Cathedral. Eventually, this would lead to what we know as the Protestant Reformation because the church, which he was just calling back to reform, didn't want to have it. And he stood pat. In fact, a few months later, he was put on trial at the Diet of Worms. And it was there, if you ever watch the movie, you get the famous, the famous line where, he, where, where the inquisitor, the attorney at the Diet of Worms told him, you need to recant. If you don't recant, bad things gonna happen. And back then the church had real power. They had the power that they could execute you, number one. But there was a bigger, scarier power. The church had the power to excommunicate. Now, why was that bad? Because if you were excommunicated from the church, what that meant was that you were excluded from heaven. You could never achieve salvation. We know better now, right? At least I hope we know better. We should. But he stood there. One man, one man 
with the word of God. And what do we always say? What's one plus God? One plus God is always a majority. And he stood there and they said, we can't. And he said, I cannot. And they said, we can't. He said, I cannot. Because it is dangerous for me and my conscience to recant unless you can show me through scripture where I'm wrong. And if you can't show me through scripture, I cannot recant. Here I stand. God, help me. And he did not. And the rest is history. And so today we celebrate the Protestant Reformation. The actual day is October 31st. Right? So tomorrow is the actual day. But the Sunday before is when we celebrate it. So if you're a little bit nerdy like me and you love theological stuff, today's a great day of celebration. So do something fun. You know, eat some beans or something, which is traditional to do <laughs> on this day, and read your Bible. And, and just remember, what started all of this for Martin Luther? Romans 1.16. Romans 1.16, where he said, I am convinced that the gospel, the gospel, not the church, not anything else, is the power of life. Period. That's it. Nothing else. So stay with that. So check it out tomorrow. I'll probably I'll probably share some stuff on Facebook. I'm off on my sabbatical. I'll sh although I'm not on it quite as much as I used to be. I'll share some stuff about Reformation Day. Great holiday. I don't have any tattoos. I'm not a tattoo fan. But if I ever got one, I would probably get like a Reformation Day tattoo somewhere. It's pretty sweet. All right. So back to what we're doing today. Matthew five. Matthew five and discipleship. Let's do a little bit of background here on the Gospel of Matthew. Gospel of Matthew, written by the Apostle Matthew. We think it was written sometime in the year 60, 70, something like that is when it was written. Placed first, even though it wasn't written first, but placed first at the beginning of the New Testament because of its awesome genealogy, which connects Jesus to Abraham. So it serves as this bridge between the Old Covenant under Judaism and the New Covenant under Christ. Okay? And also, very important to the early church, like we touched on last week, because of how many fulfillment passages it has. All through Matthew, you read multiple times. This happened in fulfillment of. Always making that connection back. Always making that connection back to the old covenant, right? Now the new covenant has come. The interesting thing about this section that we're going to read today, and really all of the Sermon on the Mount, 4, 5, 6, and 7, is that in essence, these chapters are a definitive how-to instruction manual for how Christians should live. So, do you want to be a disciple? I hope the answer is yes. Do you want to follow Christ? Do you want to be Christ-like? The Sermon on the Mount lays it out. Jesus, in essence, is teaching us how to live in the kingdom, how subjects of the kingdom should live. Right? You ever tell your children when you teach them something over and over again, and you say, you ever, have you ever uttered the phrase, you should know better? Mm -hmm. Right? You've uttered that phrase with your children. Why? Because these are things that you're taught. Right? And that's what Jesus is doing here. He's teaching us. He's teaching those who follow him. If you're going to follow me, this is the way you're going to live. Which, by the way, the... I'll put something out. There's a week in November where the new season of The Chosen comes out, and the first two episodes are going to be in the movie theater. So maybe we'll just pick a night when we're speaking up. It'll be kind of fun, right? We'll just all show up. So that'll be coming up too. And Bible study, which we'll figure something out here in the next few weeks. But if you want to follow Jesus, this is a great little instructional how to. If someone says, I want to be a disciple, but I don't know how, read chapters 5, 6, and 7. That's a great head start. So it's not the only. But it's a great head start, okay? Another thing that we're going to touch on, and I want to make sure that I stress this, please note, and it's going to be coming up a lot here in the message, the paradoxical values of the kingdom of God versus our world. Um, F.F. F. Bruce, who's one of my favorite Bible theologians, he's written so many books, he coined a term uh, when uh, writing about the letters of Paul, the Pauline epistles, called the Pauline Paradox. And what's the Pauline Paradox? Well, the Pauline Paradox is really what Paul got from Jesus, just that Paul used it a lot, so it's called the Pauline Paradox. But you read a lot in Paul's letters where he'll write, when I'm poor, I'm rich. When I lose my life, I gain my life. When, when, I, when I suffer, I'm joyful. That's paradoxical. What do you mean when I'm poor, I'm rich? Well, 
what do you mean when I lose my life, I gain my life? Well, that's the paradoxical values of the kingdom of God, which is very different than the world that we live in, than the world that we, we, we raise our children in. It's, it's a very different kind of thinking. It's a very different way of ordering your priorities and your values. And we're going to see a lot of that here this morning. So with that, brothers and sisters, open up with me. Matthew chapter 5, we're going to read verses 1 through 12. Matthew 5, verses 1 through 12. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth, and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger <clears throat> and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when you may insult you and persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We pray, Lord, that you would come and fill this place with the Holy Spirit. Fill our hearts with the Holy Spirit, Lord. Make it tender to the leading of your Fill our ears and our minds with the Holy Spirit, that we may be attentive to your word, so that we may love your word, that we may learn your word, and that we may live your word. And we ask for this in your precious name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. So, the last couple of weeks, <clears throat> excuse me, so the last couple of weeks I've been driving back and forth to Camp Wanaki, which is in Navarre. And as I drove this several times over the last couple of weeks, I started thinking back to my time at Malone. I was at Malone from 2007 to 2011. And I drove right by it many times the last two weeks, right on 62 on the way down as I went to the bar. And I love seeing that big sign that says Malone, Christ's kingdom first. I just, I love everything about it. <clears throat> and I thought back to something that I used to think was odd back when I was taking a class on spiritual development with Dr. David Oliver. I took two classes with him, one on spiritual development and one on spiritual warfare. Um, this class, among other things, on spiritual development, we learned, started to learn about spiritual warfare, which I will tell you, especially in the West, in America, in Europe, we are woefully underprepared and not understanding of the spiritual warfare that goes on in our world. Asia, the African churches, South American churches, they grasp it much, much better than we do. So I took this class, and I told you that there were some odd things that we learned. We learned about meditating on scripture. That wasn't odd. We learned really how to, how to, how to pray. That wasn't odd. Um, the odd thing that we learned how to do was he taught us how to pray with our eyes open. And that doesn't sound like it's that weird, but think about it. Whenever someone says, let's pray, we almost instinctively bow our heads and close our eyes. And he taught us that there's a, a, a something to be said when you're praying for something specifically to be looking at what you're praying for, right? That, that there's an understanding that happens within a person when you're praying for your children, when you're praying, and to, to actually be looking at them, right? We learned how to, how to pray blessings. We learned how to impart blessings on folks, right? This is really a powerful class. It was fascinating. And I think about this class often when I get to portions of scripture like this. Because to me, if there would have been a hidden camera in Malone for those four years, there would have been some really funny TikToks of my face. Because a lot of times while the professors were teaching things, I was sitting there with my mouth completely dropped because it was all new to me. It was like a newborn who discovered their hands for the first time, right? Like, oh, what? It, it, was, it was amazing. It, it was stunning. It was growing. And I think about these apostles who are following Jesus. 
And as Jesus was teaching, their mouths must have dropped. Like, what is this guy talking about? Blessed are you when you're poor? Blessed are, you, blessed are the merciful? Are you kidding me? What are the Romans? When you showed mercy in, in Roman culture, you were the first one killed. I'm t- I probably wouldn't have made it to five in the Roman culture. They didn't take any, any wimpiness, right? So the apostles, I just think what Jesus is teaching, and I know they must have said they're right. What? But they listened and they learned. In our passage this morning, which I said is the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, we're going to reflect on this word blessed, right? Blessed. And the word blessed here that we read in English is the Greek word makarios. And the Greek word makarios is equally translated in the New Testament as blessed and happy. So throughout the New Testament, when you see the word blessed or happy, likely the word being translated there is makarios. And it's actually a fair translation either way you look at it, right? And in fact, in some Bible translations, the one that comes to my, to my mind immediately is the Holman Christian Standard Bible, the HCSB. The, the, the section of scripture that we just read, instead of blessed are, it says happy are, right? And that is a fair translation. That is an okay translation for that word. And if you think about it, being blessed and being happy kind of go together, right? They're not, they're not you know, exclusive of each other. They kind of go together. Um, to feel blessed can be as simple as, as feeling fortunate about something. Uh, to feel blessed can also mean that you've received an, an inheritance or you've received something of great value uh, from God. Uh, to feel blessed might mean that you experience some special favor bestowed by God or, or something that brings you happiness. Brothers and sisters, what I think here is that the blessing that Jesus describes in Matthew 5 is really meant to imply a deep, personal satisfaction, a happiness, but a happiness that can only come when we live a life that is changed. When we live a life that follows Jesus, that's when we can be happy. I don't want to embarrass anyone, but there's someone who attends our church who told their child once, their rather rambunctious child, many years ago, who was always upset, who was always kind of, what's the word I'm looking for? Not happy, I guess for lack of a better word. But they were living apart from God and gave them great advice that I share with people all the time. How do you expect to have peace and satisfaction when you're living in a way that Jesus doesn't want you to, right? You can't. You'll never have that peace. You'll never have that calm, that calmness in your heart. It can't happen. Consider this too, and for the section that we just read here in these first 12 verses. What Jesus, because you know we talk about going from the old covenant to the new covenant, right? What Jesus just told us here in the Beatitudes, and we'll get to why it's referred to as that. What Jesus tells us here is almost the exact positive reinforcement of the Ten Commandments negative reinforcements. What does that mean? So under the Ten Commandments, the people of God were told what not to do. Don't worship any other gods. Don't take God's name in vain. Don't cheat. Don't lie. Don't steal. Don't kill. In the Sermon on the Mount, though, Jesus is telling us what we should do. You'll be blessed if you're a peacemaker. You'll be blessed if you're merciful. Later on in the Sermon on the Mount, as we go past this section in chapter 5, Jesus is going to teach us how to love, how to forgive, how to show mercy, how to pray, how to serve, how to give. All of these instructions are given to show how a Christ follower is supposed to live, especially in a world that calls us to live not like a Christ follower. So why are they called the Beatitudes? Has anyone heard of the section referred to as the Beatitudes? Has anyone heard of the section referred to as the Beatitudes? Okay, too. Do you know why it's called the Beatitudes? What to be? What to be? Yeah, of course. That's, well, that's how they teach us as kids, right? It's Anthony. I still remember Sister Virginia. 
you all should be attitudes of mercy. But you know why? Like the real reason? All right. So the big Bible, for hundreds of years, was a Bible translated by Jerome called the Latin Vulgate. It was written in Latin, which was the language of the known world. And this is the Bible that everybody had. Well, blessed are, translated in Latin, is beatus sed. Right? Blessed are. Beatus sed. And in English, over time, that just kind of translated beatus sed to beatitudes. And it just kind of stuck. So when you see beat, uh, when you hear the word beatitudes, think about the Latin phrase beatus sed. You are blessed if, right? So first, and I tell people this all the time, when you're reading scripture, in your mind, place yourself there. Think about what's going on. Think about the setting. It says here in verse 1, Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside. He sat down, his disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. Why is that important? Because what this is doing is it's setting the stage for what Jesus is about to do. Now, we know that Jesus was a rabbi. The apostles were his followers. And the way rabbinical teaching went, which is different than the way we do it today, isn't today when you're in a classroom, what does the teacher do? The teacher stands at the front of the classroom, and everybody's sitting, right? In rabbinical teaching, when the rabbi was ready to sit, he sat down. And when he sat down, everybody got quiet. He's about ready to teach. So Matthew is setting this for us. Jesus is ready to teach. So what cue does that have for us? It's time to pay attention, right? Jesus sat down. He's going to teach. It's time to pay attention. Consider also, as we hear what follows, not only is the gospel of Jesus paradoxical, it's radical for its time. It's, it's countercultural. And we're going to go through exactly why it's countercultural. We're going to hear about the poor being blessed. We're going to hear about those who mourn and who are persecuted being blessed. What is this all about? Well, it makes sense, as you'll see, but it makes even more sense as you consider it, like through some of the, the later writings of Paul. Paul the Apostle in 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved by it, it's the power of God, which again is a paradox. Think about it. If you reject Jesus, you're going to look at someone who, who died as a criminal on the cross and say, you people following him are nuts. You're fools. Why would you follow this guy? But for us who are saved by his sacrifice on the cross, that's our power. That's where we draw our strength from. And what kind of message is that? It's a message that's countercultural. It's, I'm telling you, if the Romans could see into the future and they would see us wearing crosses around our necks, they would say, these people are idiots. What? It would be like if we started wearing like uh, little electric chairs around our necks. But we understand what that is. That's where our Savior died. That's where we were purchased. Right? So we need to understand how countercultural this is. And I will tell you this. If you truly follow Jesus, brothers and sisters, and this is why we got to be strong, some people aren't going to like you. They're, they're going to have problems with you. And that's just natural. That's the paradox. So what do we do? We end up trying to co-opt Jesus. <laughs> I know that if I really follow Jesus, people aren't going to like me, so I'll just slap a cross or I'll slap a fish or a cool little Bible verse on whatever it is that I'm doing or saying or sharing, and that'll be okay. But it's not. It, it requires commitment. If you actually follow Jesus, a lot of folks aren't going to like it. And you know who this is really hard on? I talk about this with youth group all the time. It's hard on kids. It's hard on teenagers. You don't know how many times I've, I've spoken to teenagers, like, you know, I know that there's parties I don't get invited to because I'm the good one. I know that sometimes kids tease me because, I'm the, because I love the Lord. That's hard. And that's why we as parents and we as a church have a responsibility to gird up our children so that we can take it. I even have a hard time listening. <clears throat> I know for a fact, for a fact I know, that there's invites that I don't get. 
because I want the pastor there. I want him to see this is what's going on. As if, you know, we're untouchable. But it happens. And we need to be ready for it. And guess what? Spoiler alert, Jesus tells us that we're blessed when that happens. So we need to be strong in that. Remember one thing, brothers and sisters, the human heart, just like how Brown Stadium is a factory of sadness, okay? <laughs> the human heart is a factory of pride. It's a factory of pride. All the human heart does, and that's why the scriptures tell us that the human heart is evil and needs to be renewed. All the human heart does is it finds ways to justify all of the bad things that our nature wants to do. It ain't that bad. It ain't that bad. Just come on. Come on. You see, you see the really bad stuff out there? We'll get to that in a little bit. I love that one meme, one of my favorite memes of all time. It's a cartoon character, and he's sitting there, and you can see his heart, and his heart's got a little face on it. And above it, it has a, a phrase from the world that says, above all things, be true to your heart, right? And then in the next block, it's the guy looking at his heart real close, and the heart speaking, and right above the heart, what is the heart saying? Sin, because that's what the heart does. That's what the heart does. So let's get going here. We'll get into it. We'll be talking a lot about this one. So Jesus starts. He sits down. The apostles come up. They all sit. Jesus is ready to teach. How does he start? Verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Brothers and sisters, to make sure we're all on the same page here. When Jesus spoke of the poor in spirit being poor, he wasn't speaking necessarily of someone who's poor financially or someone who would be considered in the lower middle class. He wasn't talking about someone who's penniless necessarily or needy. He's speaking about spiritual poverty, the poor in spirit. He's speaking about those who understand that they're spiritually bankrupt, who understand that they're totally depraved, and who need the only way of being saved, which is Jesus Christ. He's speaking of those who desperately turn to God and say the prayer of the poor publican who said, Lord Jesus, save me. I'm a sinner. That's what Jesus is talking about. The person who, who's poor in spirit, who's broken in heart. And what's paradoxical about this? Well, it's paradoxical because sinful brokenness and spiritual happiness in our world today are not taught as being congruent to each other. They're taught that those are separate but they're not. Remember one thing, if you don't remember anything else, Jesus, our gracious Savior, turns no one away who calls on him. Not a single one. I hear from people all the time, who people who like want to poke holes at the church, who want to poke holes at my faith. How can your loving God be okay with sending people to hell? You know what the clearest answer to that is, brothers and sisters? There's not a single soul in hell that called to Jesus and was turned away. Not a single one. All you have to do is turn to him. Place your faith in him. Verse 4, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. This one here is almost like a duh, you know, statement. You know, it's like those old V8, right? Remember the... I feel like I'm 100 years old when I tell my kids this. Remember those old commercials for V8? Like, I could have had a V8 and you just ate like cotton candy or something like that. Things don't even make any sense together. This is a sort of blessing that, that just kind of hits you alongside of the head. It's the blessing that says, I'm spiritually broke. I'm spiritually broken. And Jesus says this is a place of spiritual happiness. Jesus is saying that this is actually a good place to be. Why? Because Jesus blesses those who mourn. And what are these people mourning over? What grieves them? What grieves us? You know what grieves us more than anything else? Brothers and sisters, even we don't, we don't realize it. Our brokenness grieves us. Our sinfulness grieves us. It's the same sentiment that King David expresses in Psalm 51. Psalm 51, a wonderful psalm of contrition. Uh, David wrote this, Have mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love. Because of your great compassion, wipe away my sins and wash me clean from my guilt. 
Purify me. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Restore to me the joy of my salvation. Make me willing to obey you. You don't want a burnt offering. The sacrifice that you desire, Lord, is a broken and contrite heart. And listen to something in that verse that we just read. Okay? And this is just a, a, a little freebie that I'm going to throw in there. David wrote, Restore to me the joy of my salvation. Notice that when David sinned, and in this psalm, he's writing about the sin that he committed by killing Uriah, Bathsheba's husband, and then having an affair with her, and then having a baby with her, right? The, all of these horrible sins. David wrote, Restore to me the joy of my salvation. He didn't say, Restore to me my salvation. David knew that God had him in the palm of his hands. That was not in question. What did David lose? David lost the joy of being close to God. That's what David wanted to restore. I share this story all the time, too. You know what this song reminds me of? And I know you've all gone through this with your kids before, too. I think it was Sally, although it could have been Lucy, because I'm old now and they all run together. <laughs> But one of them got in trouble, so I'm thinking it was Sally, because I almost never put Lucy in trouble. <laughs> That's the joy of being a baby. <laughs> Sally got in trouble, and I put her, one of the big punishments that I used to do with her was face to the wall. Face to the wall, right? <laughs> and Lori taught me that you get face to the wall one minute for every year of age. So if you're four, four minutes. If you're five, five minutes. Face to the wall. I really went off on her for something, and she's just standing at the wall like, <laughs> so face to the wall for four minutes. So I put her there, like literally 10 seconds later, I sit down and she's standing right in front of me. I said, it hasn't been four minutes. She goes, Dad, what? Can you hug me? I said, yes. So I gave her a hug, and then she goes, I was afraid you didn't love me anymore. Now, she knows I love her. She knows she's never not going to be my daughter. But that little kid realized that for those four minutes, there was a separation between us now. And that did not feel good, right? And that's what David's talking about here. Restore to me the joy of my salvation. Let me be close to you again, Dad, right? Jesus says that the person who was sad and by, who was broken, who was repentant of their sin, will experience a spiritual renewal like none other. Brothers and sisters, listen to me. I, I tell you this sincerely. When you finally break, when you finally go to God and say, God, forgive me because on my own, I'm not good. Let me place my faith in you, Jesus. You get a sense of relief like none other. Thank you, Jesus, right? Thank you, Jesus. Why is this paradoxical? Because only one sin, much less mourning over one sin, is not a normal practice. What's the normal practice when we're in sin? Continue to sin. Deny what you're doing. Cover it up. Cover it. It's, it's really not that big a deal. I remember those first couple times that I tried to quit smoking many, many years ago. What did I do? I would smoke and cover it up, right? And wash my hands and banaka and all that stuff, right? <laughs> Were you smoking? Nope. <laughs> right? You deny it. You, you, you try to cover it up. But just like addiction, and, and, and really, I'm sure I'm addicted to other stuff too, right? Nut or butters, whatever else. Right? <laughs> but just like any addiction, how does addiction truly get beaten? That addict needs to bottom out. Because until they truly bottom out, they don't understand the grace that God has to offer. Amen. With our sin, as long as we walk around thinking, I'm not too bad. My sin's not too bad. You'll never grasp the grace of God. One of the things that grinds my gears is when I hear people say, shoot, I'm not too bad. Look at everybody else. Well, everybody else is a disaster. Right? That's, look at Jesus. Don't look at everybody else. Look to Jesus. That's what we need to be. That gets us to the next one, to verse 5. Blessed are the meek, 
Blessed are the humble, they'll inherit the earth. I say this all the time, I know it sounds corny. Being meek is not weak, right? And meekness is not weakness. In our passage here, and the way Jesus spoke, the word meek or humble describes a person who was humble in spirit. Uh, this, consider like a powerful draft horse, right? Like a big Clydesdale. These are animals that can pull like 5,000 pounds. They're animals that I, I guarantee you with one bite of those giant horse teeth could snap your arm right off. But you put a bridle in their mouth and they're the gentlest things to control, right? That humility, a person who's humble is not weak. A humble person is a person who has submitted themselves to the will of God. This is a person who knows what it means to be spiritually bankrupt. Who knows what it means to experience genuine repentance. Not just saying, I'm sorry. Genuine repentance of his or her sin and has decided, God, you take over. Because I'm tired of trying to do this by myself. It's paradoxical because submission and power are not ever, ever viewed as, as mutually inclusive. How can you submit and still be powerful, right? Our world tells us that that makes no sense. And brothers and sisters, all of you sitting here are dialed in. You get it. I, at least I pray that you are. And if you're not, we'll pray at the end of this. But I want you to think how difficult it is for a person who doesn't have Jesus to acknowledge that someone knows better than them. To acknowledge that they're not the masters of their world. That they're not the masters of their destiny. That's a hard thing to understand. But that's what a Christian is to do. That's why Jesus calls for the meek. That's why they'll inherit the earth. And that leads us to verse 6. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness will be filled. So having bottomed out spiritually and realizing one's utter bankruptcy and grieving over their sinfulness and humbled themselves to give their lives over to Jesus, a person now desires change. What can I do different? The old stuff isn't as important anymore. Sin doesn't hold the same appeal that it once did. Power and prestige don't seem as important as it once did. Being rich isn't as important as it once was. And your goals begin to change. And your priorities begin to change. And the way you think about God in your life starts to change. That's why Paul writes in Romans 12, 1 and 2, that our minds are to be transformed. That our lives are to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. That we're not to conform to the patterns of this world. We are to look different. There's something different about that person. And that is spiritual transformation. When things that were important to you no longer are. I remember, man, I, 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 you know, when I was first starting out at work, if I didn't get promoted every two years, I quit. I'm not, I'm not waiting for this. But as you get in, your priorities change. As you come to the Lord and you understand what's really important, your priorities radically change. Radically change. And you start to look more like Jesus. Now listen to what I'm saying. I'm not saying, well, that Jesus doesn't want me to be successful. No. Absolutely. God wants you, God wants you to use every gift that he's, and talent that he's given you. But the idea of success changes. Right? Crit I, I know that the world is crazy now, so like we start like celebrating Christmas and Labor Day and everything gets moved up and all of this, right? We're going to be coming up soon where Christmas movies are going to start. My all-time favorite Christmas movie is A Christmas Carol. I have seen every single version that I can get my hands on, okay? Think about Ebenezer Scrooge. His whole life was about money, power, control, everything. He was miserable. When did Ebenezer change? When he realized that there was more to giving than to getting him. His priorities change. In fact, if you've read the book of Christmas Carol, it ends with Tiny Tim saying that Ebenezer, at the end of his life, became like a dad to him. Because priorities changed. Because all of a sudden it goes away from I have all of this to God has blessed me to bless and we're going to continue to go on there. Jesus states that you begin to hunger and thirst for righteousness and justice and things that are right. 
That's what satisfies. Because a person has become now a new creation in Jesus. And it's paradoxical because now that's the new norm. You desire what's right. You desire and thirst for, for Jesus. And this is hard because most people have a smugness about that. They feel that they're pretty good. Notice also at this point, Jesus' teaching shifts focus. For the first four Beatitudes, Jesus focused on the blessings that accompany the inner working of God in our lives. The next four Beatitudes focus on the blessings that accompany the outworking of God's blessings in our lives. Verse 5, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. So now the focus turns outward. So having received mercy, a follower of Christ shows mercy. Right? We pay it forward. God has been good to me, so now I will be good to others because I realize what God has done for me. Right? We don't, we don't just take these blessings in. How many people here have heard of the Dead Sea? Why is it called the Dead Sea? Does anybody know? We're doing a quick geography lesson. Nothing can live in it. No, why can't nothing live in it? Full of salt. Why is it too salty? Every, every river and lake is salty. No outlet. It has no outlet. So the, the lake has a bunch of tributaries going into it, but it has no tributaries leaving it. So all of the minerals and all of the salt go into one place, they build up, and it chokes out all the oxygen so nothing can live. Our life, brothers, is the sort of same way. If we receive blessing, 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 and then don't bless others, we die spiritually. We die spiritually. This is paradoxical, because we live in a world that's dog-eat-dog. I got to get mine, right? I heard LeBron say that when he went to Miami. I got to get mine, right? That's the world we live in, and that's what culture tells us. And that brings us to verse 6. Blessed are the pure in heart, blessed are the authentic, for they will see God. You know, typically when you read that someone is pure-hearted, you may have the idea to think that that's a person who only has pure thoughts. And that's a pretty tall order, because nobody has pure thoughts all the time, right? We're always thinking of bad things. We're sinful people. Being pure-hearted has more to do with being trustworthy, right? There's an old saying that goes around that says, never trust a person who doesn't trust anybody, because they're likely a person who can't be trusted, right? When Jesus spoke of being pure-hearted, he meant that as we mature in our faith, we need to become increasingly real. We need to become increasingly authentic. We need to become increasingly honest before God and before others. I've said this many, many times. This comes down even when I talk about people who don't understand the words that they say. Boy, I'll tell you three powerful words that we hear in the English language all the time. Love, friend, and trust. I'm not totally sure that we understand what those words mean when we throw them around. Because those are powerful words. But Jesus knows what those words mean. And as a disciple, and as a Christ follower, you should know what those words mean. This is paradoxical in our world because the world wants us to be pretentious. The world wants us to impress everybody. Like we have to have a facade, right? When you've got social media, you've got your personality on social media and then who you really are. But the closer we come to God, the more we should be like, I don't care. I don't need to impress anybody. I'm comfortable in myself. Great example of this is real. 20 years ago, when Grant built our house, at one point, a wa the water main that came to our house from the street broke, okay? And I didn't know what happened. I just woke up one morning, and there was a pond in my front yard, but it hadn't rained. And I'm like, well, that doesn't make any sense. How did that happen? So Grant called the excavator. The guy came out, it was like 9, 10 o'clock at night, he came out with a machine that has the, um, what the heck is that called? The backhoe, back yeah, he came out with the backhoe, and put up big lights and dug this huge hole. And then the guy jumped down in there and, and the hole, like he was like shoulder deep in this hole, right? And I was standing there and Grandpa was standing there and the other guy that was running the backhoe was standing there. 
and Grant had on this pair of shoes, I'm not even kidding, completely held together with silver duct tape. He had a toe sticking out of one of them, the rubber on the bottom was completely gone, and this guy looked at Grant straight up and he goes, Dale, buddy, I know times are tough, but doggone, you gotta be able to buy yourself a new pair of shoes. And Grant said, I only got seven years of these, I'm hoping to get three more out of them, right? <laughs> Grant, Grant's comfortable in himself. He didn't have to be out there every day with fancy shoes. I'm pretty sure you guys have to come for this right now. I got slippers on. It's all good. <laughs> right? You're comfortable in yourself. You don't, you don't have to put on a show. You don't have to pretend to be something that you're not. Amen. Because you're in Jesus. Right. That brings us to peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. You know, God made the world for peace. In Isaiah chapter 2, it looks forward to a time when the Lord is going to mediate all of the battles between nations. Hammers will be turned into, uh, swords will be turned into hammers, and plowshares into pruning hooks, and no nations will fight against each other anymore. But brothers and sisters, especially today, our world, our country, our culture, our schools, our homes, our churches, they need the soothing influence of good and godly peacemakers who walk into a room and listen before they talk and ask questions and speak with grace and gentleness and kindness, who offer good counsel and guidance led by the Holy Spirit. Peacemaking is paradoxical with the world because the world loves conflict. The world loves division. What drives it? Ratings on the news, conflict, controversy. One of the greatest gear grinding things that happens to me is when I see friends who put on Facebook, this is how I believe. And if you don't agree with me, you can unfriend me now. What kind of world we live in where you can't disagree with somebody? I had a friend of mine that I graduated high school with. We've been friends <laughs> for 35 years. I get a message from her out of the blue when, I don't know, some, something happened in the news, I don't even remember a year ago in politics. Out of the blue, she says, hey, just so you know, and you know I get an email that starts, just so you know, it's probably not gonna be good. <laughs> I know you're all churchy now, <laughs> but I'm gonna be posting a lot about whatever this was in the news. You may not like it, so you may just wanna defriend me. I called her. I said, we've been friends for 35 years. We've literally been arguing every day since we met freshman year of high school. And now we have to stop being friends because we disagree. She ended up apologizing. But what I really hope is that somehow, some way, she saw a little glimpse of the way Christians are supposed to be. You're not supposed to hate everyone you disagree with. That doesn't even make any sense. <clears throat> and that leads to number, uh, numbers eight and nine, those who are persecuted for righteousness will be shown mercy. In other words, if you're going to be persecuted, if you're going to be insulted or mocked for any reason, better it be because you're a true disciple of Jesus. Because such a strong disciple can stand on their love for the Savior. That your walk, that your faith is so strong that you're actually persecuted for it. It's incredibly hard. Especially, I mean, I pray so much for our kids, our our little ones, our teenagers, and they live in a world where they're bombarded with trying to, to live differently than the Lord wants. And it's hard, and we need to prepare them for that. And Jesus ends this passage in verse 12, Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for the same way they persecuted the prophets and all who came before you. I want you to notice something here, brothers and sisters. These, these Beatitudes, they build on each other. And they all go together. This is not an a la carte menu. You know, I'm going to be merciful, but I'm not really going to be a peacemaker. These all go together. You can't pick and choose. And when they all come together in the heart of a believer, they truly become a disciple of Christ. So here's the question for all of you today. And only you can answer this question. Are you going to be an attitude of mercy? Are you going to be an attitude for peace? Are you going to be an attitude of gentleness? Or really, and even maybe the more important question, 
Are you ready to listen to the words of Jesus and obey them? Amen? Amen. Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you very much for your word. And Lord, sometimes your word is hard. And following you, Lord, is not easy. But what we know is that you have gone nowhere that you don't expect us to be with you. And that everywhere you expect us to be, you are there. So Lord, help us. No one can follow these things without the Holy Spirit. So Lord, fill us with it and let us come to you. And Lord, if there's someone struggling right now listening to this, if there's someone who, who, who hasn't fully given their lives over to you, if there's someone that somewhere still has a little stronghold inside of their heart that says, Lord, I'll give you all my sins, but this little one I'm going to hold on to. Lord, let today be the day when they let go of every bit of it and they give it all to you. If you're sitting there and you feel this way, simply ask Jesus, Lord, be with me. Forgive me of my sin. I'm truly sorry. And let me give it to you. And help me from this day forward, Lord, to follow you more closely. Help me from this day forward, Lord, to truly be a Christ follower. To truly be a disciple. That when people see me, they may see you. It's not going to be easy, Lord. But nothing that's worth it is easy. With you, everything is possible. So keep us there. Fill us with the Holy Spirit and strengthen us with everything that we need. We love you and we ask for this in your precious name, Jesus. Amen.